Hello, and welcome to our latest edition of the Tech Strong AI podcast. I'm Amanda Rosani, and with me today, of course, is Mike Bazard. How are you? I'm doing great. Always happy to be back talking about, well, not only our favorite subject, but apparently the entire world's. Oh, yes. All things AI. And we're going to start with AI anxiety. There are several things happening in the AI world right now. The biggest one being, let's see, Elon Musk dismisses his lawsuit against open AI, but he can always just file it again. Uh, and we also have the Federal Trade Commission and Department of Justice looking into the Microsoft OpenAI partnership. And then we have even the Pope weighing in on AI at this point, which tells you how big AI has spread around the globe. So what are your thoughts on all the issues happening around AI right now, Mike? It seems like they all have one thing in common. There's a lot of AI anxiety in the world. I don't know if we're maybe you need to take some medicine about that, but um, I guess my question about the whole thing is like, well, we're talking about it certainly, but I don't feel like we're doing a lot about it. Everybody's saying that somebody else should do something about it. So um, I feel we should get in front of this more. I mean, I think we all agree that yeah, at least the latest iterations of AI are profound. Um, maybe they're not going to replace humans and maybe they're not going to start thinking on their own anytime soon, but the impact on society is going to be substantial. And yet we seem to be all standing around waiting for something to happen. That's probably going to be bad. And then we're going to try to figure out how to fix it. I'm wondering if maybe we could sit down and start thinking about what's likely to go wrong and get in front of that. Yeah, I think it, and and maybe there are some committees we've heard about that are doing just that. But I think it's very important that even um, companies uh, have committees that are formed thinking about what's the worst case scenarios or what are some problems that could occur with AI, and then how can we counteract and prevent these early. Yeah, and the problem with looking to the courts for any of this is, well, something has to go wrong for them to determine when it was wrong, and then apply some sort of remedy thereof. So. Looking to the judicial branch isn't going to be especially helpful. That leaves us, say, Congress and the president. Um, I wonder if part of this issue is going to be that we're so divided on a million other issues that we can't ever seem to come together because one side just can't stand the fact that the other side might look better than them for five minutes. Um, maybe we can find some bilateral approach to this, but yeah, it feels like chaos is reigning. And, you know, all the tech bros are just pushing the envelope for technology as they always do. And nobody's kind of sitting around going, can we have an adult conversation about what this is really about? Yeah, and I think it comes down to a good, diverse group of individuals helping with this issue. Having, you know, professionals from different companies that are highly involved in AI is good. But then also having non-AI professionals. How about some... Um, you know, psychologists, some analysts, some various other professions that can can speak to this issue from an outside lens that aren't directly AI experts necessarily, um, but are maybe um, better at communication or um, better at um, other areas that need to be addressed, not just specifically AI professionals. Right. And there's a tendency for the experts to dismiss the government officials, because they're like, oh, well, they never know anything and they don't know anything about this, that, and the other. And well, yes and no. I mean, if I look back in time, government officials don't seem to know a whole lot about a lot of things. And yet we muddle through and manage to come up with some reasonable uh, regulations or depending on your point of view, at least something we can tolerate um, for all kinds of industries in the past. And we have successfully navigated that. And we're in, in the middle of that conversation now in cybersecurity, and I get you that it's messy. It's the nature of democracies. It's not ever going to be perfect. But I think there's this tendency to uh, one side is basically dismissive of the other, and the other one is basically now starting to figure out that maybe they don't trust those guys because they're basically in it for the money, and they're not thinking about the greater good. Yeah, and that's why what I mean by having more than just them involved in this picture. I would just point out to all the folks that are in it for just for the money that 
if you continue down that path, I promise you the regulations will longer term be more stringent than you would ever want to see. So it's in your interest to kind of, you know, take your hat in hand and with a little humility, start making your trips to Washington and explaining to these people what's going on, because that which they do not understand, I guarantee that they will legislate to contain, especially when they figure out that, hey, this stuff is being used, well, to determine elections. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's another frightening matter altogether, is it's been proven that AI is being used to try to interfere with elections from several of, you know, other countries. Yeah, and maybe, who knows, you know, maybe it will take the Pope and half a dozen other religious leaders around the world to shame all these people into doing something constructive. <laughs> Well, we'll see. It's certainly a, a lot to try to get a hold of, and it's going to take a while. So next, let's move on to, there's an article on DevOps.com about Mendio detecting AI code with a new tool. So can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, this is kind of a, hopefully to be expected on the one hand. It's like we have tools for scanning code and surfacing vulnerabilities and we should be able to use the similar concepts to figure out where the code came from in the first place. Was it actually written by a human? How much was it was it influenced by a machine? Uh, MEND has indexed all kinds of uh, Gen AI sites to help determine that. I'm sure there'll be more tools in a similar vein, and each of them will be slightly different, and one might be better than the other. You're going to have to test them to see how they actually work. But... We need to know the provenance of the code that's being put into our systems, and just as we would for any human. We need to know uh, what kind of machine built it, how reliable was that machine, uh, how was that machine trained, and put some sort of rating in there, because all this stuff winds up in our software. And if you haven't noticed, there was an effort, again, from our friends in Washington to create more stringent regulations holding us accountable for the quality of the software that we deploy including all the security vulnerabilities that go with that. And if they don't trust us, guess what they're going to do? Same as before. So, again, we need to get in front of this. This is a big step in the right direction in terms of, hey, let's see what's going on with this code. And the more transparency we have, the better off we're all going to be. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I want to say that this kind of ties in a little bit to um, something I skipped on the list. But there's another article over, and this one's actually on TechStrong AI, and it's about uh, Protect AI disclosing 32 vulnerabilities in NVIDIA and Intel AI platforms. So um, what what sort of things were they detecting there that we have to be on the lookout for? Well, uh, they say banging your head against the wall and expecting a different result is the surest sign of insanity. And here we are once again. So the issue with these AI models is it's not that the model itself is inherently insecure, but rather the code and the tools and the things that we use to build these platforms had known vulnerabilities in it. So when you use them to build something else, guess what? All that stuff carries forward. And then bad guys are now launching targeted campaigns looking for these vulnerabilities in AI platforms because they know they're there. They've already discovered these vulnerabilities elsewhere, and they're just kind of laughing at themselves going, Awesome. The most important asset you're ever likely to build in terms of a software company is an AI model, and you're going to have the exact same vulnerabilities in it as you had in everything else. So thanks for doing all the work for us, because now we can just sit back and scan for it. And Bob's your uncle. We got to compromise. Yeah. So uh, what is what is really the answer here? Because, you know, the more we have AI integrated into everything, the more it seems there's more risk of vulner vulnerabilities and it's connected to everything. So how do we get in front of this issue? Well, this is going to get part of the thing where we need to actually cooperate and collaborate with each other. And a lot of companies are just not that good at it. Um, here's the thing. I, I cannot see another way around this. So we have all this open source software that we're dependent upon. The quality of it varies depending on how committed the maintainers are of that project to remediating vulnerabilities, realizing that the maintainers of those projects are not being paid for those efforts. So when a vulnerability is discovered, it's a dependency. 
that they may or may not get around to addressing anytime soon. So if you're a company dependent upon that, you're taking on that risk that goes with that. You may attempt to patch it yourself, create a patch for it and fix it yourself. But now you've created a fork of that project that you are now going to try to uh, maintain and support for God knows how long until maybe it gets rolled back in or somebody takes it as a contribution. So that's not very efficient. I think ultimately, if we're going to have this kind of play, uh, countries around the world need to come together and say, how are we going to fund something that looks like a open source security remediation program that we can get to all these things faster and not just leave them out there. And um, maybe that's, a, I don't want to use the word tax, maybe it's a levy though on enterprises that use this software because basically they're consuming this for free and then using it in some sort of commercial endeavor it may not be software they're selling but it's certainly software they're relying on to drive some sort of business process somewhere but i think you know everybody needs to sit around a table and say what's real here because these days of the wild wild west of open source software where people are just downloading whatever it is and then throwing it into whatever applications including ai applications that's kind of insane when you think about it yeah, absolutely. They really need to be a little bit more intentional and careful. <laughs> so moving on, we have an, another article on DevOps.com. This one is about Shreds AI LLM focusing on software engineering. Can you explain a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I, this is just cool stuff and kind of points to the future where all this is going. And there's probably, you know, more folks building similar models, but the thing that separates this one is two levels. One is uh, the code you can generate and orchestrate is a lot more complex than what you're currently seeing in ChatGPT. So you can, you know, create almost an entire uh, software engineering workflow using this thing. Um, so that's the first part of it. Second part of it is this thing can actually has enough of a reasoning capability to orchestrate the management of other LLMs. So you can use this to uh, essentially offload a task to, I don't know, pick your favorite, chat GPT or whatever Google's got going or uh, any one of the meta, pick one, doesn't much matter, and, and say to that LLM, this is your task, go execute that and then send it back to me in a somewhat asynchronous fashion. So it's interesting that you can now have an LLM manage other LLMs and if you think about that a little bit, it's not just going to be for software engineering, right? The same thing is going to play out for any given process. And eventually, uh, LLMs will be supersets to other LLMs. And of course, there'll be small language models as well. And all this stuff is going to get orchestrated. And the more that that gets uh, orchestrated with a reasoning engine underneath it, the more complex the processes are that you can manage. So I would say maybe we're in the Stanley Steamer age of AI. Yeah, that certainly would make it easier because right now a lot of them are isolated and you have to go in between all of them. So it'd be nice if they were all working together and you could use one to to get through to all the other ones. In theory, this is true, but um, the one golden rule of AI is, hey, it's one thing to be wrong. It's quite another thing to be wrong at scale. So if all these things are wrong together, unraveling that mess will be something to behold. This is true. So relearning how to learn. This is an interesting article over on TechStrong AI. Uh, Pegasystems unveils a generative AI tutor for training the models. So share a little bit more about that. Yeah, their approach is interesting. And I think they're on to something. What they've done is they've said to Gen AI, their implementation, hey, be, allow people to input a question such as, you know, how do I do X? How do I do Y? And they have an understanding of where that person is in their skills and, the, and their knowledge. This is awesome, right? Because today we treat it as kind of a one size fits all. I mean, if I look at any kind of online training, it's roughly a variation of the same thing you experience when you go to traffic school. It's like, here, watch this video. And then here's a couple of examples of this thing. And then, you know, you should replicate that here during a test and uh, we'll give you a certification. And, and College is not much different, actually. So what if the learning process was much more interactive and open-ended and you could just type in and say, 
um, you know, here's what I want to know. And by understanding your question, the LLM implicitly understands how much knowledge you have and tracks how much knowledge you have as you go along and surfaces other things you should be asking about and, and thinking about as it relates to your question. Because half the battle is sometimes I know something, but I don't know the right question to ask next to go to the next logical thing to learn. And so, you know, a lot of people wind up being half taught something because they didn't understand or didn't see what was the next right thing to do was. And I just think there's an opportunity here to rethink the way that we all learn. And I'm hoping that this will be better than right now. We're kind of on a path. I feel like we're going to trust the AI too much in the sense that we're going to accept that whatever it says is the way to go. And we're, we get a little intellectually lazy sometimes. So I'm hoping that maybe more people will be interested in learning how something actually works, including the LLM, so that a, it's not as scary, and B, uh, if it is going wrong, you'll know about it a lot sooner. Yeah, absolutely. I think that training and education is key, especially as you know, as we are integrating this into everything, and we hear about the the lack of skills in certain areas. So, education is going to be key moving forward. See, and it all comes back to our first day. If we know more about LLMs and how they work and what's going on with that. We may not be as uh, inclined to be overly restrictive because we don't understand something. If we're afraid of something, we're going to lock it down until we understand it, right? That's how we kind of operate as humans. Uh, so maybe the first step here is just to, hey, let's start exposing people through the education process more to LLM so that they understand how it, they, it works. And frankly, if you're going to use this stuff successfully, it's not so much about, it's not a search career, right? It's not like I'm going to go type in something and it's going to give me an answer. It's a much more interactive uh, question and answer, almost trial and error process to get to the thing you're looking for, for an output. It's called learning how to ask questions. And some folks say the real sign of intelligence is the ability to ask the question, not necessarily provide the answer. Absolutely. And and that gets a little into the whole, you know, prompt engineering thing that we were all keying on a while back. Uh, just knowing how to work the tools um, and get the answers in the way that you're looking for. All right. And we're back way in full circle. Let's go to prompt engineering camp. What do you say, everybody? We'll just take uh, two weeks off and go on down by the beach or up by the mountains and just have people teach us prompt engineering for as a life skill. That would be cool. <laughs> yes. Well, that brings us to the end of our list. So do you have any last thoughts today, Mike? Experiment. I mean, this stuff's not going away. So the more you know, the better off you're going to be and the more you can talk to other people about it. And no one trusts anybody more than another human. Now, sometimes that works out well. Sometimes it doesn't. But um, given all the options, I'd rather trust a human. Yeah, absolutely. I was uh, speaking with some friends the other day and I said, it's not going to hurt you at all to get on chat GPT and play around with it and ask it some things. It's not going to hurt you and it's just going to help actually train it better. So there you go. All right. Well, thank you to our audience for tuning in today. And again, go read some of those articles if you want full details about any of those. Again, most of them are on TechStrong AI. A few were on DevOps.com. And then let us know what's the most interesting to you. What would you like to hear us talk about in the future? And have a great day. All right. See you guys later. And don't forget the importance of natural intelligence.